Good afternoon and welcome to RSSL Sterile Manufacturing Webinar Series. Today's webinar is Sterility Testing and Overcoming Difficult Products. Before we start the webinar properly, um, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping points with you. If you've got any technical issues, if you can send a short message in the chat box, we can try and resolve them for you. Obviously, they're not always um, issues that we can resolve from our end, but if we can, we will try. Also, during the webinar, we'd like to encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. Again, if you use the questions box, um, we will take the time at the end of the webinar to ask as many of those as we can to Tim. Um, if we don't get round to any of them, I will send um, out the answers along with the slides and a white paper that Tim's put together for us. So, um, welcome to this third in our autumn series, webinar series. For those of you who've attended our webinar series before, welcome back. Um, if you're tuning in for the first time, my name's Annette Russell and I'm the Sterile Manufacturer Lead here at RSSL. I work in the commercial team and I work really closely with our pharmaceutical microbiology team to help support our clients. This is actually the seventh webinar we've been lucky enough to have Dr. Tim Sandel put together for us. And I would encourage you to, if you haven't already, to take a look at the previous webinars we've run, as these have some really interesting and some hot topics that um, hopefully you'll find useful. You can find all of these webinars at our website, which is www.rssl.com. If after the webinar you'd like to learn more about our offerings, please feel free to contact me direct either via the email or the telephone number you see on your screen at the moment. As I mentioned, I work closely with our pharmaceutical microbiology team and this is the team as of today. Um, my role is to work with this team to help our clients' projects um, through to completion. So we as a team offer a flexible approach and hopefully a mutually beneficial partnership. I really enjoy working with the team um, who are based in our new Wokingham facility and we support both sterile and non-sterile manufacturers to the highest possible standards, enabling them to release product in a timely and efficient manner. We are able to do this by offering things such as the endotoxin testing using the LAL method, sterility, which is the new service we launched earlier this year, uh, mycoplasma, which we are hoping to have fast mycoplasma by the end of 2021. We can also do raw material testing for all your um, raw materials, along with any vial and stopper testing that you may be required. Around the wider business, our team of experts can also help with more complex projects, such as those investigative um, problem solving products, um, projects, sorry, such as a foreign body isolation, um, identification or setting up reference databases for your fill finish line. We can also help with cleaning validation and disinfection validation, which is a big requirement of the new Annex 1. And we can help and advise with your environmental monitoring. This can include both on site visits and any follow up analytical requirements. Those who were here for the last webinar will remember that Christmas had come early for RSSL and we were very excited to be in the process of installing our brand new Molditoff. Jamie Tempest, seen here on the screen, is our steri sterility supervisor and he's agreed to come on the line to tell us a little bit more about our Molditoff, um, which is on site now and fully qualified. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Nat. So, Jamie, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to tell us a little bit more about the RSSL new Molditoff. So, can you tell me um, briefly why did RSSL decide to invest in a Molditoff? So, over the last 18 months, we've had a huge increase in the request for identification work. 
Um, we were able to accommodate some of the in, in, some of the identifications in house via some more traditional methods, but the demand has been so high, especially um, towards the tail end of 2020, and we had to subcontract a large amount out out, um, which wasn't ideal from a customer experience point of view. Um, and we were given the go ahead to purchase some Aldi stuff so we'd be able to do it in house. Okay, excellent. And so um, what benefit does this give our clients over those traditional methods? Um, so the benefit over the traditional method is it takes some of the subjectivity out. Um, but one of the main benefits is we're now, if we're from the subcontracting point of view, we're no longer essentially the middleman. And as such, our clients can benefit in terms of cost and turnaround. We now have control of the whole process from start to end, and we can tailor our offering to our individual client requirements, and we're able to give them the service that we know we're capable of delivering. Okay, that all sounds really exciting. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for your time. No I'd love... I'd now like to um, introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Tim Sandel. I'm sure many of you have heard of Tim and subscribed to his publications. Um, Tim has over 25 years of experience of microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. Tim is a member of several editorial boards and has written over 600 book chapters, peer review papers and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and is a visiting tutor at both the University and Manchester, University of Manchester and UCLA. Thanks. I will hand you over now to Dr. Tim Sandel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And hopefully, um, I'm coming across loud and clear, and you can see the screen. Okay. Great, so it's, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Um, so this webinar is building on um, from one we did earlier, which was looking at um, limitations of sterility testing and with um, sterility test failures. And what we're going to look at in this webinar is kind of touching upon some of the challenges that sterility testing presents, looking at method suitability testing, revalidation, different types of filters, um, and then looking at some of the products that present greater challenges and require methodological variations in order to get them to pass. Um, so just as a reminder and as a way of recap, um, there are two principal methods of sterility testing as defined in the pharmacopoeias, and these are membrane filtration, and direct inoculation. And as things stand, the membrane filtration method is the method of choice. And this is because all of the contents of a small volume product are filtered, or at least half the contents of a large volume product pass through the membrane filter. So we're using a much larger sample size than is possible with the direct inoculation method. Now developing um, methods care must be taken with the establishment of the method so it can be demonstrated that any microorganisms present in the product can be recovered at least within the limitations of the cultural based methods now another reason why there's the um, preference for membrane filtration is also that um, the system is enclosed within canisters and these minimize the transfer steps and thereby lower contamination risks. We also have the, uh, the fact that the method is more adept at overcoming interference factors. For any microorganisms that might be present in the product under test are far more likely to be separated from potentially inhibitory substances in the product through the act of filtration or if they remain, if any of these inhibitory substances remain on the filter, then there's a greater chance of being able to rinse them away through the rinse steps following the filtration of the product. A membrane filtration is generally regarded as the appropriate method for aqueous alcoholic or oily and solvent products. And this is using a standard filter manufactured of cellulose esters or other similar plastics. 
And the simple principle is, is that the filter acts to separate the product out from any microorganisms. And then we apply a rinse solution such as phosphate buffered saline or ringer solution to remove any product residues. And that's to overcome this risk of antimicrobial residues. However, it does stand that some products will not readily filter. And this is particularly the case with some proteinaceous products, which tend to block the pores of the membrane filter. Or we may have a product that is in, so inherently antimicrobial that the membrane filtration method is in itself inappropriate. Or it might be just we cannot simply validate the membrane filtration method. So in these circumstances, the direct inoculation method is used. And when the direct inoculation method is selected, it's important under European Medicines Agency guidelines that it's first of all demonstrated that the membrane filtration method could not be undertaken because you need to use the method of choice first of all. So the direct inoculation method involves the addition of a portion of the product into two different culture media, which are the same media as, re as used in the uh, membrane filtration technique. The amount of product transferred into the media, though, cannot be any more than the 10% of the volume of the culture medium. So if a typical media bottle like the one shown on the slide is around 100 mil, then the maximum aliquot becomes 10 mil. So, I mentioned about the importance of qualifying the method. So this is where method suitability testing comes in. Now, unlike some analytical assays, the culture-based sterility test is not validated as the method itself. Rather, the validation element is a test of the culture media in the presence of product. And this is to show that should microorganisms be present, then the product itself does not cause the inhibition of microorganisms. So what we're not trying to do is recover a known quantity of microorganisms from the product, but purely to show that the product allows the organisms to be recovered should they be present. So for this reason, the pharmacopoeia used the phrase method suitability test. And in days gone by, this was more commonly referred to as bacteriostasis and fungostasis testing. And this needs to be conducted either for each product or for each group of products if we are able to adopt a matrix approach. Now, when approaching method suitability, the key criteria to consider before carrying out the exercise are review of filtrability, whether there's any chemical compatibility issues between the product and the filter membrane or the media, uh, the appropriate rinse fluid to use and how, what level of volume we wish to do, and then to consider potential inhibition issues and how we might address those, whether that be through dilution, chemical neutralization, filtration and rinsing, overcoming enzymatic activity, working out the filter type and the quantity of the sample to be used. And the validation involves using a panel of microorganisms, and these are described in the pharmacopoeia and are the same ones that are used for media growth promotion testing. Now, alternative culture collections can be used to those listed on the table, but the important thing is to demonstrate equivalency with the ATCC strains. And ATCC is reference to the American type culture collection. These days, it's common to supplement the organisms on the table with environmental isolates. So these are organisms drawn from the manufacturing facility or perhaps from a previous sterility test or media fill failure. All cultures must be no more than five passages removed from the original supplied culture held within the culture collection. And this is to avoid any phenotypic changes or any instances of genetic drift that might cause a genotypic change. And the chance of this happening increase with each successive subculture, 
which is why the limitation is put on on the number of passages. Also another risk of doing too many subcultures is the risk of contamination and the loss of cell viability. <clears throat> now with the issue of environmental isolates, then decisions are required relating to the number of isolates to include with each method suitability test, the rationale for their selection, which should normally be drawn from reviews of facility microbiota. And here it may not be necessary to include organisms that are very similar to the recommended organisms. So for instance, Staphylococcus aureus appears in the list of pharmacopoeial recommended organisms. Therefore, it could be argued that there's little value in including Staphylococcus epidermidis as an environmental isolate. You also need to make decisions about recovery time. So for the um, type cultures, the recovery time is a maximum of five days. And this is because these are healthy organisms that are adapted to growing on highly nutritious laboratory media. But is that the case for environmental isolates? Or is it the fact that they, we were trying to recover organisms from the stress state need a longer time. Whatever time's picked, it needs to be shorter than the maximum incubation time of the sterility test, which is 14 days. And then we also need to decide on the frequency of rotation in terms of changing environmental isolates. And also if we see a significant change in the facility flora, at what point do we need to consider revalidating part of the sterility test in order to show we can detect the organism of concern. There are differences with method suitability for cellular products and these are subjected to a separate pharmacopoeia monograph. So within the European pharmacopoeia, instead of 261, which is the standard sterility test monograph, we are referred to 2.6.27. And here cells are inoculated into media, either by manual or automated methods. The media is incubated at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius for not less than seven days. And the challenge microorganisms are slightly different to those used for the standard sterility test set. And again, for the method suitability requirement, the cell products need to be seeded with the selected bacteria and fungi and then subject to testing against each method. Now, just looping back to this concept of revalidation or the repeating of the method suitability test. So we can present some reasons for revalidation as a change to the product formulation. If we wish to change the sterility test method, now it might be that a proteinaceous product, for example, has become purer. So what was required to do by direct inoculation could shift to membrane filtration. A change to the membrane filters or a change to the media formulation as notified by the media manufacturer, or perhaps a change to sterility test kit manufacturer. Where there's more doubt and perhaps some um, more reason to, for discussion with the QA department would be perhaps if we're transferring from a clean room to an isolator or we're undertaking technology transfer from a laboratory in a pharmaceutical company to a contract test facility such as RSSL. And also whether there's any change to uh, the organisms we're finding in the environment as I mentioned um, earlier. So for some of these latter points, there needs to be decisions taken within each company. So a complication that arises with sterility testing is that some products, particularly solids or articles, require manipulation prior to filtration or to direct inoculation. So typically this may involve dissolving the product in water if the product is water soluble. So this might be the case with a freeze-dried product or dissolving the product within a solvent, such as for the pre-testing of some creams or water-insoluble substances. The direct inoculation, either dissolving or adding the solid or disassembling the article directly into the culture media is also sometimes required. We also may need to adopt a heating step to facilitate or to speed up the rate of dissolution. 
Now, variation to these approaches can influence the success or otherwise of passing the method suitability. And the big risk is that such approaches can often be variable. So it's important to consider all the possible differences, such as things in product, value, product volumes, mixing times, heating times, and so on, and to make sure that the worst case examples are captured within the method suitability exercise. There are also some products, or due to the preservative that's added into them, that possess antimicrobial activity. So these products will not pass the sterility test validation without some form of manipulation. And it may be that only some microorganisms will be inhibited and not others. So for example, in my experience, Aspergillus resilensis is the most resistant of the standard validation microorganisms to any traces of antimicrobial substances and also to a cultural environment that's not necessarily been optimized. You may well find it's a different organism. But the important thing is that where some microorganisms are recoverable and some are not, this still remains unacceptable. And the method needs to be continued to be worked upon in order to reach a stage where every organism in the panel can be recovered and exhibits growth within the sterility test. And we take a look at some of the general variations to technique that can be adopted with products that will not necessarily pass sterility testing straight of all. So the first thing to take a look at is with the type of membrane filter in relation to the membrane filtration method. And filters can be divided up based on different properties. So we can have hydrophobic or hydrophilic, and also with the primary material of manufacture, such as nylon, cellulose acetate, cellulose nitrate, or polycarbonate. And all filters to a degree will have some product binding characteristics, but at least we can overcome those to a degree by selecting the right filter. So for a standard aqueous based product, hydrophilic filters are the most commonly used and particularly those manufactured from mixed esters of cellulose. And hydrophilic filters can be wetted with virtually any liquid, and they can allow most liquids to pass through the filter effectively. With hydrophobic edged filters, then these are widely used for the membrane filtration of antibiotics. And these again will be manufactured from mixed esters of cellulose, polyvinyldiene, difluoride, or polycarbonate. And this is because the use of a conventional hydrophilic filter to test antibiotics poses the risk of leading to the antibiotic remaining, particularly at the periphery of the membrane, which would then affect the recovery of any bacterial growth. Hydrophobic filters can also additionally help to separate microbial cells from the product, allowing the rinse solution to more effectively rinse away any surviving residues. Another factor um, to consider is with the um, membrane filtration pump speed. So when undertaking the membrane filtration test, controlling the pump speed can assist with the filtration of certain products, such as reducing the amount of foaming or reducing the tendency for the filter to block. It's unlikely that variations to the pump speed alone will make a significant difference as to whether the material can be successfully tested or not, but they can help to overcome complexities that might arise in carrying out the test on a batch by batch basis. So it's important that when you're carrying out method suitability testing to record the pump speed that was undertaken during the validation exercise because this can avoid problems occurring when the method is then transferred over into routine operations. Now, if inhibition cannot be overcome by selecting the appropriate filter type, then rinsing the filter can often help to overcome the antimicrobial effects 
particularly when the product becomes bound to the membrane filter. Here, rinsing can help remove residues. And I said earlier, the common rinse solutions used in the sterility test are saline, peptone water, phosphate buffered saline, or ringer's solution. And each of these solutions can be used for basic rinsing when no additional neutralization is required. And the reason why these can have, are required is because they help to maintain an osmotically balanced environment, which can help with microbial recovery. And you remember with the method validation, we're spiking the rinse solution. So we don't want the rinse solution itself to cause osmotic shock and to affect the recovery of the challenge organisms. We also need to avoid the filter from drying out. So it's important to pre-wet the membrane filter with a little bit of rinse fluid before conducting the membrane filtration test and to ensure that the test volume is always kept to an acceptable minimum so that the filter does not dry out during conducting the test. So this presents a challenge with small volume products. So it's often that small volume products are pulled um, using the appropriate number of samples into a single bottle or adding them to a uh, sterile solution. Now, sometimes neutralization is required as an addition to the rinse fluid or added to the medium used in the direct inoculation test. And here, much of what we do today is reliant upon um, research conducted by Proud and Sutton, who developed universal diluting fluid. And this itself was based on the day Engelly neutralizing broth that was put forward in the early 1970s in relation to testing disinfectants. And what this is, is an optimal solution for neutralizing antimicrobial activity and to allow the recovery of microorganisms. And studies on the universal diluting fluid have shown it to be particularly useful against compounds like thiamersal, uh, benzyl clonium chloride, biguanides, and, and so on. Variations can also be made with rinse solutions through the addition of other neutralizers. So common additives include things like polysorber 80, which is a very good dispersing agent, or another surfactant like Triton X100. Now polysorber 80 is a non-ionic surfactant and it contains uh, an emulsifier. And it's derived from polyexylated sorbitan together with oleic acid. And Triton X100 is also a non-ionic surfactant, which has a hydrophilic polyexylene oxide chain together with an aromatic hydrocarbon group. Now, there's a little bit of uncertainty with Triton X100 as to whether it is toxic against certain organisms within certain conditions. So again, including all of that within the validation exercise is of great importance. And when testing antibiotics, the main neutralizer is penicillinase. And this is a specific type of beta lactamase that shows high specificity to, for penicillins. And this is an enzyme produced by some bacteria or fungi that's responsible for resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics. So when added to the rinse fluid, a beta-lactamase is able to cleave the beta-lactam ring and destroy the activity of the antibiotic, ideally allowing microbial recovery. So on this next slide are examples of other neutralizers that have proven efficacy against different antimicrobial agents. So uh, these can also be explored for different sets of conditions. And while this is primarily for adding to rinse solutions from membrane filter, um, for the direct inoculation set test, there are also different neutralizing agents that can be added to culture medium um, to help inactivate different antimicrobial um, compounds. Another step that can be undertaken in helping to overcome antimicrobial activity 
is with varying the number of rinses. Um, now, the pharmacopoeia places a limit on the number of rinse solutions that can be performed, which is five times 500 ml. And this is after the recommended three times 100 ml has been attempted. Now, if you look at earlier editions of the sterility test monograph in, in the European pharmacopoeia, which is around sort of the, the pre-2001, then the pharmacopoeia did once allow um, unlimited number of rinses. That's now been uh, reduced down to this five times 500 mil. And the pharmacopoeia did also once allow dispensation for a product to be released without validation, if this was acceptable to the particular regulatory authority. However, now that dispensation no longer exists and it's incumbent upon uh, the user to keep on experimenting with neutralizers and rinses and so forth in order to achieve a pass result. But it stands that even by varying the amount of rinse solutions or the formulation of the rinse solution and the addition of neutralizers, that some products remain difficult to get to pass or to test through the sterility test. And this still often comes down, particularly with direct inoculation, due to the tenacious attachment of residues to the filter membrane. And there are some products that are you know, particularly fraught and difficult to, to test. It also stands that some products are not testable using the culture media described in the pharmacopoeias. And therefore, it is permissible to seek modification using alternative media. Now, with alternative media, some one of the recommended ones is instead of fluid thioglycolate, is to try fluid sabro media, particularly where the potential for, if we're testing a uh, antifungal compound, in some cases with water, uh, there can be cases made to use R2A, which is Reasoner's second generation um, agar broth, preferable to tryptone soya broth, which is due to this particular medium's ability to yield higher numbers of bacteria from water, based on the principle that bacteria in low nutrient environments might be better recoverable within a low nutrient culture medium. Another example is with penicillins, where we, you can also add penicillinase to the actual media itself. And furthermore, um, we need to consider um, whether we're going to what we're going to do with medical devices. So here there are talk of alternative thioglycolate mediums, and a further modification is with the addition of, of the neutralizers, as I previously um, mentioned. Now, another factor with direct inoculation is that some products um, prior to direct inoculation can have their antimicrobial properties overcome through dilution of the culture media. So for culture media volumes, we need to allow I mean, the key thing here is to ensure that um, we still have sufficient air space in the tryptone soya broth in particular to allow for aerobic organisms to be recovered. And also we need to be mindful that we can't add any more than 10% of the uh, product volume to the medium. Another problem of increasing uh, volumes too much is that it could result in a low recovery of any low level contamination. And that could lead to um, false negatives occurring. And there's also risks with too many manipulations as well. So as an alternative, instead of increasing volumes of culture media, an inhibitory effect might be overcome by dilution of the product. So, for example, um, if we were testing something like benzo alcohol or a phenolic compound, then actually diluting that um, 
say one in 10 or one in 50 in water, and then transferring that into the medium for the direct inoculation test might be preferable. But again, the uh, method suitability testing needs to be robust. We can also have problems presented with turbid products, especially when the direct inoculation method is used. So this can occur at the end of the standard sterility test incubation, the 14 days. And this is where turbidity is observed, but experience shows that it's most probably the reaction of the product in the media. Again, with protonaceous products is a particular problem. And here we need to carry out a subculture and continue with the sterility test. So the pharmacopoeia advises that we transfer not less than one mil into a separate culture medium and then re-incubate that. And again, this could be fraught with challenges in terms of getting a representative sample and also with avoiding cross-contamination and leading to a false positive sterility test failure. There are further issues with um, testing of combination products, like a number of medical devices. And again, this is not all that straightforward. Um, and there's a problem as well in terms of defining whether the product is a medical device or it's classed as a pharmaceutical. Now, we can have um, products that are single entities, which is a device that's comprised of two or more regulated, regulated components that are physically, chemically or otherwise combined or mixed into a single entity. We can have kits, which are two or more separate products packaged together, such as drug and device products, or we can have products that are cross-labeled, provided separately, but tending to be used together, where both are required to achieve the intended use and where a degree of cross-labeling is needed. So here we have things like um, collagen sponges, catheters, pre-filled syringes, and so on. And the reason for pulling out the distinction between um, the defined medical device and the pharmaceutical product is because the medical device sterility test as defined in ISO 11737 part two, which was updated uh, in 2019, is that it only requires TSB to be used or the equivalent soybean casing digest medium, which is incubated at 28 to 32 degrees for 14 days. When attempting to uh, test and to do method suitability with antibiotics, then it's especially important to pre-wet the filter with the rinse solution and never to let the filter dry out during testing. And I said earlier about using hydrophobic edged filters to ensure that no product residues remain as these residues would potentially cause the inhibition of microorganisms. And also to use an antibiotic neutralizing rinse to sometimes look at if this is successful of increasing the concentration of the neutralizer uh, together with the up to the maximum number of rinses. Um, and also to look at the filter composition. So an alternative filter media might be preferable, such as polyvinyldiene difluoride or polyester sulfame. Um, and this is because the more conventional cellulose-based membranes do have this tendency to bind antibiotics. And also with um, the speed that we might um, subject the um, pump through as well can also be a key variable to control. Um, for an oily product, um, we also need to consider um, uh, things like eye ointments, and these can prove difficult to test because any microbial cells present can become embedded into the matrix of the product. So in order to remove any microorganisms present, then it's useful to use an emulsifying agent, again, such as polysorbate 80 or a light paraffin. And when conducting the tests, the oil should be allowed to penetrate the membrane at its own weight and be filtered at a slow speed, applying pressure or suction quite slowly. 
Generally, oils of low viscosity are run through dry membranes. With viscous oils, then it's important to filter slowly and then uh, to rinse very carefully. With fatty oils, then we probably want to heat the oil to around 40 to 44 degrees in order to help with the filtration. And once the samples are incubating, then it's important that they are shaken every day uh, in order to avoid too much clumping, although we need to be careful when shaking the fluid thioglycolate as not to create excessive aeration. Generally, with um, ointments and creams, then um, we need to um, dilute these, often one in 10, by emulsifying with a suitable emulsifying agent in a suitable diluent like polysorbate 80 or liquid paraffin. And this helps to provide uh, an aqueous vehicle that's capable of dispersing the test material, material in, in a homogeneous way um, through the fluid mixture. And this also helps to improve contact between the sample and the culture medium. And if this doesn't work, then the emulsifying agents can also be added to the culture media itself. So for example, might be adding 10 grams per liter of polysorbate 80 um, into the medium. And following the addition of the emulsifying agent, then it's often best to mix 10 ml of the fluid mixture with 80 ml of the medium as well. So this can also be a, a useful technique to practice. Now the testing of aerosols and the, uh, in cans can also prove problematic. Now, until commercially adaptable membrane filtration kits became available, the old fashioned way of testing aerosols was to freeze the containers in an alcohol dry ice mixture for an hour. The container was then aseptically opened through puncturing and the contents transferred to a sterile pooling vessel by expelling the contents. The main concerns here are obviously the risk of adventitious contamination, um, the risk of alcohol entering and giving a, a false negative, or the can even exploding. Um, so while that method, this method is still sometimes used, there are now commercial membrane filtration units that allow the connection of the nozzle directly uh, and the transfer of the contents into the filtration unit, which gives much greater assurance of a sepsis. With the testing of cell lines, then um, a different approach is required. And this involves selecting the appropriate culture medium and incubation conditions, which are going to vary according to the types of cells being tested. And here, an, an often an alternative to the thioglycolate medium is advisable because standard FTB is often toxic to some cells. And often these are approached by uh, thawing different cell lines to be tested and pooling them, centrifuging them in order to separate the culture from the cells and then transferring about 0.5 mil to the culture medium or sometimes a variety of different culture media. And again, this will vary very much according to the cell type. And often where we have concerns about mycoplasma contamination, then that needs to be subjected to a different type of testing. The conventional sterility test is not adept at detecting mycoplasmas. And for testing highly proteinaceous products like fibrin sealants, which are like thrombin based glue type products, then um, it's, this can be highly variable and there's often there's a lot of batch to batch variability. So we need sometimes need to look at the amount of diluent added and the type of dilution there. And here often the degree of agitation or heating or stirring speed is quite important. And even a one degree variation in the temperature of reconstitution can make the difference between whether a membrane filter, filter blocks or doesn't block as well. With um, infusion assemblies, then if the item's too big to be um, immersed, then an alternative is to flush the lumen and to collect the rinse fluid, accumulate that for 
20 units and then to add that to the culture medium but they are particularly tricky to test um just going back to some things on the on the solid items um if the article cannot be fully immersed into the culture media then you can either look to go for larger quantities of culture media so it's permissible to go up to 2000 milliliters to try and do an uh, immersion or to aseptically disassemble or to find some mechanism to rinse the article and to test the, the, the rinse solution. But this is often where a number of variations need to be introduced into the process. Radio pharmaceuticals um, and anti-cancer drugs present problems often because they're absorbed into the membrane filter and recovery is very difficult and often uh, forms of direct inoculation are practiced and the problems presented are first that the total amount of material available for testing is often limited so we may have to do a smaller quantity for the sterility test we also have issues of shelf life often where many products are used within a matter of hours, some time before the sterility test is available, which is in the, obviously in the case of days. Now, although GMP requires us to still carry out the test, this is much more on the basis of assessment of controls rather than on a batch uh, pass or reject um, basis. And we also may need to be sure that um, any residual radioactivity is not creating false negatives. There are a number of rapid microbiological methods emerging which um, are challenging the conventional sterility test. So we have respirometry pressure sensing technologies and these are concerned with the detection of metabolic activity which is determined by pressure transients relating to gaseous exchanges within a closed culture vessel. So essentially here we're looking for microbial respiration and detecting that. We also similarly have growth-based carbon dioxide detection, where again detection of carbon dioxide indicates the probable presence of viable microorganisms. There are methods based around ATP bioluminescence, where an enzymatic reagent catalyzes the conversion of ATP into ADP and then generates light. And we also have viability staining, which can be used in conjunction with solid phase cytometry. So these are methods that are appearing on the scene. They have their advantages and disadvantages, um, but they are challenges to pharmacopoeial sterility tests. And the FDA Code of Federal Regulations does permit exploration of these as alternative methods. It's also, just as my last main point, um, that the sterility test is always carried out under aseptic conditions. There do remain risks of, a, of adventitious contamination. So it's important that steps are undertaken to minimize this and we are using controlled environments. And obviously the more manipulations and the more variances from the standard pharmacopoeial method, then the more risk there is of introducing contamination into the process. Okay, so this brings this uh, main section of the webinar to a close. So we've looked at test methods, method suitability testing, the need or not for revalidation, difference between filters and neutralizers, and then looked at some of the more challenging products ranging from turbid products to antibiotics to oily products and to cell lines. So um, thank you for your attention so far, and uh, we can move over to the Q&A. Thank you, Tim. That was um, really interesting. We've had quite a few questions come in, so I don't know how many I'll get through. Um, first of all, I had a question from uh, Kim, and she says, is testing for Clostridium still required for growth promotion testing, even if your product, product is an ophthalmic product or an injectable? Um, strictly speaking, according to um, Pharmacopeia, 
Um, but that isn't to say that you can't make a case to vary that, but that would need to be based on what goes into a product license and then what gets approved by um, a regulator. And you'd, I guess, need to have evidence that um, anaerobes would not pose a risk and there's nothing in the manufacturing environment that couldn't be a source of anaerobes. So absence of compressed air or any other gases, for example. So um, with all these things, you know, th there's a lot more um, freedom to make variances from pharmacopoeia, provided you can put together a sufficiently robust justification. Okay, um, and I've got one from Alex asking, how can we avoid a filter drying out during membrane filtration? Um, this can be quite uh, tricky. So it's very important to pre-wet the filter and experience gives an idea of, of how much to add. But you want to add, add a few mil onto the filter and then start filtering the product slowly so that you don't get to the point where it dries out. Now this can happen with small volume products, so particularly where we're testing vials of say five or 10 mil or smaller. Here it's often better to bulk them up into a larger volume and then to filter that, that one single volume, which is another way to try and avoid that filter drying. But, and that's partly because the, the drier the filter becomes, the harder it is to filter and the more chance there is of building up residues on the filter, which then become harder to rinse. So you get stuck into a vicious circle. Okay, um, I've got a question from S Suresh. Um, when sterility testing is contracted out, do we need to take into consideration environmental isolates from both the manufacturing facility and the contract testing facility for the method suitability validation? Um, that's a very interesting question and uh, one where there's no exact right or wrong answer. So the inclusion of environmental license is fairly standard. There are still some who would say, what's the point? But it, but it is more closer to the norm. So the fact that environmental license should be included in the sterility test validation is pretty widely accepted. Whether the contract test laboratory needs to include those or not would really come down to what is set to be covered in the technology transfer arrangement because the degree of validation is going to be dependent upon whether the same test kits are used, whether the exactly the same source and type of culture media, the rinse solutions, the techniques and so on. Um, so the belt and braces answer is yes, they would be included, but it doesn't necessarily need to be so depending on what are the variables involved with the transfer and what are you seeking the contract test laboratory to to replicate so it's on a case by case basis but obviously the the, the zero risk option is to include the environmental license right i see um keeping uh, to the environmental isolates for a moment i've got a question from thorsten about how many environmental isolates should be used in the validation again that's uh, obviously there's no guidance on that um, it, it is a variable question in my experience it's between two and four um, it kind of depends a little bit about what are the most common organisms you're finding from the facility and also to develop the point I was saying earlier about how similar or dissimilar they are from what's included in the sterility test set so in order, for example, for recovering organisms, I, I'd be very surprised if any species of Staphylococcus was different from any other species of Staphylococcus. So if you happen to find Staphylococcus epidermidis as your number one environmental isolate, and the fact you're including Staphylococcus aureus in your sterility test set panel anyway, there's probably no need to include it. However, if you found uh, bacteria, which can also be carried by people in clean rooms, 
in relatively high numbers. That is not included in the sterility test set. So there might be a case to include that as an environmental isolate. So it depends on what the profile showing, how frequently it changes, but two to four is my experience is around the norm. Right, and a, a question from Chan, um, he's asked, bacterioides fragilis is not commercially yes. available. Can it be replaced or justified by using only Clostridium sporogen? Um, yes, it can be. Again, you, if you, uh, my, I've seen people do that where they've written position papers showing similar characteristics and and done that substitution. So yes, it is possible, and, and I'm aware of the challenges dealing with bacterioides in, in, in general, getting a hold of it, and that it's actually a very fastidious organism to, to deal with at the best of times. Um, and I've got a, a question from Charles, and he said, is there guidance for low fill volume products to pull prior to filtration to allow for an even split between canisters? Um, yes, that, that is a fairly um, standard um, method and Pharmacopeia does permit the pooling of um, small volume products. Um, the Obviously, the, the key thing is to ensure that if you're, you see some say it could be so small that you do then need to add them to a, um, uh, an isotonic solution. Um, if you're going to add them to a solution to create the, the bigger volume, you need to make sure that they're, you, you've then got a homogenous solution. So the degree to how much you might be mixing that is is important. And then to ensuring that there is um, even distribution between the two chambers that form the membrane filtration test. So, yeah, it's perfectly permissible, but you, you've also got certain variables that you need to control more fully. Right, okay. Um, and a, a question from Rachel, do you have any advice for subculturing turbid products in terms of the contamination risk? Um, it, it is, yeah, they are fiddly. Um, the best thing is, is to go back into the, if, if you're fortunate to have an isolator to do the sterility test, or if, you, or if you're not using the UDAF within the clean room, is to tr do all the activity back inside the sterility testing area. Um, you might need to do some additional work to show that, because if you're showing the light when you're putting your meter into the isolator, that you're not getting inhibition, you might need to doubly show that, that two rounds of, of decontamination isolator is not creating any problems, and then to um, conduct that carefully with um, syringe and, and needle because the thing you don't want is to get obviously cross-contamination which will then send you into the sterility test failure area. Okay and I think I'll time for one last question here. This is from Hannah. Do you have any recommendations for filtering foamy products? Um, foamy products are quite challenging. Um, it's all about the membrane filtration pump speed um, and you do need to go quite slowly and this can take a bit of discipline on the part, the person doing the sterility test because they probably want to get it done fairly fairly quickly and they're having to run it and especially um, the, the worst things I've seen are um, albumin based products be they from human or animal origin and they can foam quite excessively um, so you kind of really sometimes into the region of like quarter pump speed. Um, and again, ideally, going back to the point I said at uh, some point in the presentation, is that you should really establish the pump speed or range of pump speed during the method suitability testing and ensure that goes into the SOP. And you really should have like um, a list of different products and different pump speeds that are suitable for those different products. And that will help to avoid um, things like foaming, and then foaming can then lead to um, filters blocking, uh, etc. So it's best to avoid that. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, I'm sure there's loads more questions we could be asking, but we're, we're running out of time now. So thank you, Tim. Thanks for your excellent presentation. 
and thank you to all of you out there who are currently um, listening to our presentation. I hope you found it interesting and we appreciate the questions that you've asked. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, I'm going to put them to Tim and we will send them out along with the slides and the detailed white paper. So this is the last in our autumn webinar series and with the positive news of COVID on a vaccine on the horizon, I hope you all get to enjoy Christmas with your family and friends. Here at RSSL, we'll be running another series of webinars and technical talks throughout 2021. So keep an eye on our website and our LinkedIn posts for details going forward. So on behalf of RSSL Sterile Manufacturing Team, I would like to again thank Tim for delivering such informative webinars during this series and our spring series. And for all you out there, thank you for listening. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or if you need any support in any projects. Um, have a great Christmas and we hopefully will see you in the new year. Thank you. <laughs>